A very good evening, everybody. My name is Anna Maria Arabia. I'm the Chief Executive here at the Australian Academy of Science, and it is my great pleasure to introduce you to, welcome you rather, I will be introducing later in the evening, to welcome you here to the magnificent Shine Dome. We're really pleased we're able to have um, events here again in person, in real life, and it's wonderful to welcome you all here. Now, of course, we're here for the event called uh, What If Scientists Rule the World? Now, I'm of the view that it should be called Now That Scientists Do Rule the World. Um, we, we have lots uh, to thank science for, particularly, well, for, for a very long time, but particularly over the last 18 months or so. Um, look, before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Ngunnawal people, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. I'd also like to acknowledge any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who might be in the audience this evening. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Uh, tonight, you'll experience a very unique theatre performance, Forum Theatre. It's a form format that relies on interaction with the audience. That's you. So I think we're in for a treat. I have no idea what's going on, what's going to go on tonight. Uh, so I'll be rolling with it as well. Um, let's see how we go. Everyone in the Shine Dome and hundreds of people around the world watching online are part of this show. It should be fun. We'll be exploring the question, what if scientists rule the world? And spe specifically, the challenge of communicating science that can change the course of existential threats facing our world. Tonight's performance is a partnership between the Australian Academy of Science, the Falling Walls Foundation in Berlin, and Reba Theatre right here in Canberra. We'll hear more about that at the end of the performance. Uh, before I introduce you to Ali Clinch from Rebus Theatre, just a couple of housekeeping matters. If you could turn your phones to silent, that would be terrific. Um, should the fire alarms sound in the most unlikely event that they will, exit through the exits either side and make your way to the entrance where you came into the building and the assembly area is in the car park. Um, and uh, the toilets are out through this exit. Um, ladies are straight in front of you and the gents are to your left. Um, enjoy the performance. I'll now hand you over to Ali. Thank you and welcome everybody. Welcome to those that are here 
live with us at the Shine Dome. Welcome to those on Rendezvous. We have members from across the globe here uh, represented, and welcome to those of you who are watching us um, from the comfort of your own homes online on YouTube tonight. It is absolutely wonderful uh, to be with you tonight to explore this interesting concept of the pros and cons of the influence of science in our world today. So, uh, as Anna-Marie mentioned, my name's Ali Clinch and I'm an artist that works with Rebus Theatre. And Rebus Theatre is a company in Canberra that predominantly works with mixed abilities um, actors. And we work in a form called Forum Theatre. And Forum Theatre, much like Anna-Marie, I don't know what's going to happen tonight. You're going to help me get through. I've got a question I've got to ask. And, and here live, uh, online, and our friends here, they're going to help us see if we can solve some problems. So yeah, I'm not sure how it's going to end either. We're going to work together to get there. Um, so I want to mention how lucky we are to be standing here on Ngunnawal country. And I want to mention the the Aboriginal's relationship to storytelling and science and how special it has been for many tens of thousands of years. And it is wonderful to see the coming together of artists and science in the collaboration of Rebus Theatre with the, Academy, uh, the Australian Academy of Science to come together to create this really interesting, hopefully exciting evening um, of, of great debate. So um, I'm going to introduce my friend Brett here. He's our Auslan interpreter today. Welcome also to my co-facilitator. So I'd like to introduce you to Cara. Cara is tuning in from Melbourne. Cara, can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Welcome, everyone. So Cara is going to be our online facilitator with our group here. Would you mind just very briefly introducing who we have on the screen um, and, and where they're calling in from? Yes, sure. Um, so my name is Cara. I am coming to you from Wurundjeri country, which is Melbourne in Australia. We have uh, Agnes here, who is coming to us from Canberra, Australia, I believe. Yes. Uh, Maria, could you give a wave? It's coming from Spain. We have Stephanie coming to us from Kenya and Lewis from the United Kingdom. Uh, so that's wonderful. And those that are online, um, we have another facilitator. I want, you to, I want to introduce you to Paul here. Paul is your man. He is going to be your voice in the space tonight. So he's looking at the comments. He's got several devices running at once. I'm glad I don't have his job. But anything that you are writing in the comments on YouTube, Paul is reading. And so if I ask for comments or ask for ideas, your ideas on YouTube should be able to come into this space. Paul will raise his hand and he will speak on your behalf. So those that are um, online and around the world, um, could you just quickly type in the comment section where you are tuning in from? We'd love to hear that. And those that are in the space, I'd like you to turn to someone you don't know, which is a bit tricky with these chairs, I understand that, but in a way that doesn't damage yourself, turn to someone that you don't know and just briefly introduce yourself. Who are you? Why did you come tonight? Have a quick chat. Okay. And just coming back together now. I 
relish in how enthusiastic you are to talk to each other because that is an essential part of forum theatre working. I'm going to turn to Paul now because we have asked who is listening from around the world and I think even though this is quite an intimate space here in the Shine Dome, it's good for us to remember just how well connected this event is. So well, Paul, what have you got? It has been such a constant stream and they're still coming through. I have Kansas in the United States, Berlin, Sydney, Vienna, India, Estonia, Queensland, Sweden, Pakistan and they keep coming. Woo! You know, one of the benefits of COVID is that the world is more accessible and it is really wonderful that we're going to be able to not just hear from the voices in this space and um, from our online group, but to hear from voices across the world. So that's fantastic. Thank you, Paul. Let's begin. Let's start. So let me introduce you to our cast. We have a cast today of two science communicators and three actors. So it's a beautiful coming together of the arts and science. So I'm going to introduce you to them now and who they will be playing. So try and remember who they're going to play because it will help save confusion later on. Some of our actors are playing more than one character. Okay, introducing Joe. Everyone say good day to Joe. <laughs> Joe is going to play Fiona, a science communicator. Okay. Introducing Phil. Everyone say good day. Now, Phil is playing two characters tonight. Phil will be uh, a scientist, and then he will also later on play a CEO of a factory in a town called Petersville. And that factory makes thingamy bobs. <laughs> That's right. And introducing Linda. Say good day. Linda will be playing Sam. Sam is a journalist from the newspaper. Introducing Joel. Say good day. Joel is playing the mayor of Petersville. And introducing Robin, last but not least. Robin, say good day. Robin is playing Stefan. Stefan is a long-time worker um, from the the Thingamy Bob factory in Petersville. Okay? All right. So let's begin. Let's begin. This is Stefan. Stefan has three beautiful children Ruby, Michelle, and Cameron. Stefan works in the factory, and he's been working in that factory for 20 years. He lives in a town called Petersville. It's one of those towns way out west. And he's mates with everybody in town. He's been there forever. He's good friends with everybody there. <laughs> Great. Uh, and let's meet Fiona. Fiona's the science communicator. She studied science at the university. She has a little dog. And she calls it Fluffy. And she's been working in the science communication field for about three years now. So we're going to go now to a moment where she's explaining to some undergrad <coughs> students what science communication is as a career path. And then after that, she's got to have a conversation with a scientist about a recent journal article. Let's watch. Okay, so when you all graduate, there are going to be a whole pile of different options that you can go down, and I never expected that I would be where I am today. Science communication is so exciting. We get to chat to all you know, sorts of different scientists and try and help them explain science to other scientists who might not understand what they're doing, and mostly to members of the public who um, may not have the same kind of background in what they're doing. So um, it's really exciting. Um, I've actually got to go now, so I'm really sorry, but uh, um, if you have any other questions, email me. Okay. Thank you, everybody. That's the end of today's lecture. On Tuesday, we'll be on to quantum chemistry. Lots of fun there. See you then.
Professor, hi. Hi, T. Hi, um, how are you going? Uh, congratulations on that paper. Thanks, thanks. Well done, Nature Chemistry, that's oh, huge. Well, yes, it's uh, good to have some runs on the board in these times of uni cuts. Absolutely, I think we should capitalise on this and get this out to the media. So I was just going to come and have a chat to you and um, see what you thought, maybe give me a kind of two sentence summary about what the paper's sure. about. The more exposure we can get for the lab, the better. Absolutely. So it's all about the mechanism. You know, this is a new mechanism we've discovered, not been seen before, and it's very complex because depending on the, the exact experiment, it goes all kinds of different ways. You can get a tiny bit down to 0.1% or 10% of fastoids or lastoids, nastoids, bastoids, or toids. Nastoids. Oh my goodness, okay. Um, I am kind of gravitating towards that because nastoids are toxic, aren't they? I believe so, yeah. Yeah, okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to concentrate on that. I'll see if I can write something up and then maybe send it through to you for approval. Sh well, I'd, I'd love to help, but I'm actually off to a conference in Perth, so oh, I'm okay. heading straight to the airport. But don't worry. You've done a great job before. I trust you. The next morning, our science communicator sits down with a 30-minute deadline to write the media release about the nastoids. As she writes, she hears the voice of the scientist and the journalist in her head. Let's watch. All right, 30 minutes. This has got to be good. I must remember the mechanism. Okay. That's boring. I need to make it snappy. It's the heart of the science. All right. Um, scientists at the university have recently discovered a possible link between... Wishy-washy. Who's going to publish that? That's very true. Uh, scientists at the university have recently discovered a potential link between uh, the production of nastoids and the breakdown of polyubiquitous in the production of... There's too many productions in there. Don't forget the fastoids, castoids, <sighs> bastoids, lastoids and toids. Okay. <laughs> How does it affect people? People want to read about themselves. Okay, okay, oh, okay, I think I've got it. All right, uh, scientists at the university have discovered a potential, uh, no, not potential, scientists at the university have discovered a significant link between the toxic compound nastoids in the environment and the manufacture of thingamabobs. Well, if that's the hook that gets them in, Let's go with it. Okay, I like that. All right, send. One hour later, Sam, the journalist, gets on the phone to our science communicator to find out a little bit more about these nastoids. Let's watch. Hello, this is Fiona. Uh, I just wanted to get a quote from Professor Theo about that um, nastoid discovery release you just sent out. Oh, yes. I'm so sorry, but actually he's on a plane at the moment and he doesn't have any reception. Ah, uh, okay. Um, we really need to get this up quite quickly. Uh, is there any chance you could give me a quote instead? Oh, I really don't feel comfortable with that. Well, we can't put it up. My editor will dump the story if there's no quote. And as a representative of the university, I know you have some kind of input and a uh, scientist yourself. Yes, um, I mean, all right, okay, what do you want to know? Uh, just if you think there'll be any kind of human impact. Okay, uh, well, if there are nastoids in the environment, nastoids are known toxins, right? That's going to be bad? <laughs> <laughs> bad? Um, there's, a, there's actually quite a large thingamabob factory out in Petersville. I don't know if you have any opinion on how that might affect them and their economy. Well, I mean, I didn't actually realise there was a big factory out there, but like I said, if nastoids are toxic, if they're there, then that's possibly something we should be looking at. You know what, Thea, I, I can work with that. Thanks. So, Sam publishes the article and news hits the town 
And we move now over to Petersville, way out west, that town. You know that town, way out west with the factory. We all know that town. And so we now have a scene with the mayor and Stefan. Let's watch. Mayor, oh, you've seen Stefan, this. you've seen it too. Yeah. Yeah. Life threatening nastoids linked to Thingamabob production in Petersville. This is the link. No, this no, is... Stefan. We, you know, we were all terribly shocked by what happened to the children. This is not it. No, look, I mean, three kids, my Ruby and two other kids, dying of mysterious illnesses in three years. No. And, and now here we've got proof Stefan, that there are toxic chemicals coming look, from the factory. I'm going to go talk to Bruce at the factory. Talk to him. I... You go and shut the factory down at least until we can sort out what's going on here. So things have escalated. The mayor puts in a phone call to the CEO of the factory that makes the thingamabobs, that in the production of the thingamabobs creates the nastoids. Are you following? Good. And they make for an emergency meeting that afternoon to talk about the impact on the town, the impact on industry. Let's watch. Really? You found something. So, a, really, a paper out of Edinburgh. That's great. International science. Oh, fantastic. You guys have done a great job. Thank you. Jim. Bruce. It's not as bad as you think, mate. My safety team are onto it already. They've already done a literature search and found some science that blows this right out of the water. An international group in Edinburgh, and they went back to the original paper, and if you read it carefully, 10% is one end of the scale, more likely 0.1 of a percent, which is well below human toxicity. Stefan came to me this morning, Bruce. He's talking about shutdown. Oh, Stefan. I wish I could give him a link. I wish I could... It's been so tragic for him, but... I told him this isn't it. This isn't it. But he's going to tell everybody, isn't he? We've got to get, We've on, got the to front. get on top of this. We've got to get on the front foot, yeah. Town meeting. I think we should call a town meeting. <laughs> so, you call it, I'll speak. You'll speak? I'll back you up. They'll remember you for this, Bruce. They'll remember you come council election time. So they call a town meeting and word spreads around the town, there's a bit of hysteria. Sam, the journalist, thinks, I might get in touch with the science communicator again, just to let them know one of the sort of outcomes of this article that she's put in the mail. So at least let's watch um, the, the, the morning of the town meeting very early in the morning, the science communicator meets with the professor. Let's watch. Professor, oh my goodness, I am so glad you're here. Have you read the news recently? Ah, looks like your media release went really well. Good <laughs> yes. stuff, you. Yes, it did. Uh, possibly a bit too well, because now it turns out there's an entire town called Petersville. Have you heard of it? No, neither had I. Don't worry about it. Petersville has an entire factory that just, like, it employs most of the town, and now they're all completely panicking about these nastoids, and just, I think this is my fault, and I don't know what to do. Nastoids? They're on to nastoids. But there's only a very small chance it could be lastoids, castoids, bastoids, zoitoids. <laughs> I mean, that's true, but the nastoids are toxic, and that's what we... Oh. So, uh, what are we going to do? I mean, uh, I, I, and the other thing is that other paper out of Edinburgh. Oh, you heard about that. They already got on to me. <laughs> I mean, Jimmy emailed me straight away. He's so triumphant. I mean, to get the Journal of inconvenient chemistry up against nature chem. <laughs> oh, it's really. I mean, uh, it's from 10 years ago, too, I right? I know. Look, I've got easy tests that can disprove him. I've got them up and running in the lab already. A couple of days, we'll have results yep. that show that they are completely out of order. Okay, awesome. 
In the meantime, Sam, do you remember the journalist that was writing the story? She got in contact with us and wants me to go, wants, you know, us to go to the meeting, the town hall meeting that they're holding. I'm running the tests. I can't get away. Okay. Um, all right. Well, I'm going to go. Um, if I get a chance to speak, what do you want me to say? Well, like I said, it's only a tiny chance that, and, and the levels might be low, but I mean, it's toxic, so I suppose if you wanted to be really super careful, you might want to stop production until you checked it right out. So you're saying shut the factory down? Yeah. <laughs> cool. Later that night, we come to the town hall and workers are there, parents are there, just average, everyday people are there at the meeting. Let's watch. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. This is obviously a very distressing time in our town, a lot of dangerous talk going around by now. You've all read the paper suggesting possible manufacturing defects in our plant. Now, I've spoken with Bruce at the factory. I'm convinced that Bruce and his team are doing everything practicable for our safety. I've invited Bruce to speak to us all here tonight to address the safety checks that are going on. Bruce, thank you. Thanks, Jim. Thanks all for coming today. I'm really heartened and uh, honoured to have you here to talk to me because I want to tell you that as the CEO of the factory, which is the heart of our community. My, I thought the kids were at the heart of our community. The kids have been dying. Stefan, please. My concern, my utmost concern is for your safety as workers and members of the community. You're like family to me, and I would never, ever try to put you in danger. So what I can tell you now, my safety team have already been onto it. Uh, this is the paper the original paper for which this media blow-up was based on, and it says here the levels can be as low as 0.1 of a percent, and that's way below human toxicity levels. But this paper out of Edinburgh is blowing a complete hole in that. It says another different mechanism that does not produce any nastoids. So breathe easy. Any questions from the floor? Um, are you concerned about the threat of strike in response to this significant risk that's mentioned in... Absolutely, I'm concerned about a strike. That would be a gross overreaction because we can't go jumping at any slight hint of toxicity that we'd be stopping the plant every day for those kind of things. You can't just go checking for plutonium because somebody thinks it might be there. It if wouldn't be very we good for your profits either, would it? Stefan... My profits are your profits. This is what holds our community together. And if we have to shut down the factory and go through some extensive testing thing, that is going to mean layoffs. That's going to put a hole through the company. We've already got that Kenyan company who are wanting to produce thingamabobs and they'll try and steal our market share. We cannot afford that in these difficult economic times. So my call to you is do not panic. If we can't... How many we, kids should die before we should start to panic? Look, if we let scientists rule the world, we'd be broke and out of a job. Oh. Um, That's all. You mentioned an Edinburgh Journal article as well. Could you tell me more about that? Yes, uh, Journal of Inconvenient Chemistry, uh, 2013. Right, so uh, almost a decade ago then. Um, yeah, so it stood the test of time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Now, I want to implore everyone, please, do not rush into any hasty or premature action. I will be in constant communication with Bruce, and I'll be letting you all know what's going on in the town. You have our word on your safety. <coughs> Are there any questions? Um, have you invited anyone else to speak tonight? You're like someone without any vested interest? Vested interest? Bruce's sole interest is in the safety of this town and his plant. Now, we've heard from Bruce. Bruce is the most relevant person to hear from at this point. Now, I will be closing this meeting, ladies and gentlemen, and I ask you, please, all I would love to see you at the church fundraiser on Sunday. 
Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much and good night. So after the town meeting, the town decided to wait, to not run hastily into any decision. And our story now jumps two years. Two years later, we meet Stefan in the car park at the local hospital. Let's watch. Yeah, babe, yeah, I'm still at the hospital. You know, it's over. 20 minutes ago. Yeah, it was, it was just the same as what happened with Ruby. I was there with him. I love you too, baby. And that brings us to the end of our play. So that's the end of the story. Can we give our actors a big round of applause, please? <laughs> now I'm going to invite all our performers up. Um, if you could come and stand in your original places for me. So now we get into the interactive side of the night. Um, I want to invite, <laughs> look at that, inviting <laughs> our friends from around the world to come and join us, give them a wave, check that they can see us. Yes, fantastic. And um, also just letting you know, watching online, the comments have power and they're being read by Paul. So if you do want to say anything, please write it in there and he will do his best with the 250 plus of you that are on there um, to get the messages through. So we have a scientist. We have a science communicator, a journalist, a mayor and a townsperson. I want you now to turn to the person closest to you and I want you to have a chat about two things. Firstly, whose responsibility is it to make sure that science is communicated clearly of these people? And my second question is, if at any point Fiona, our science communicator, did something differently, would we have the ending that we have in the play? Is there something she could do to change that ending? Have a chat now. <sighs> right, thank Great you. Great job, team. Sorry, I think we're doing well. How do you end up writing that final story? How many people are going to I think it should be a tearful farewell for Stefan leaving the town. Have you? He's lost his job. You can go and take a drink. Have a drink, yeah. So my first question to you is, and I, I, I'm actually really interested, there's a, quite a few young people in the room, and by young I'm going to say under 25, okay? Um, <laughs> there's a few young people in the room. 
Um, I'm interested, um, if you want to pop your hand up and tell me which character you think is responsible for science communication. Okay, I have one hand up down here and I'm going to walk over to you. I've got one microphone and because of COVID I have to hold the microphone but you get to speak into it. So, hello, what's your name? Leo. Liam? Leo. Leo. Leo, who's responsible? Which character? A science communicator which was Fiona. Good, you get 10 out of 10 for remembering who it was, a science communicator. Um, and just a show of hands, who agrees with that? Oh, there's a, there's a little bit of this. Anybody else think somebody else is responsible? And, and I open the floor to all stages of maturity. <laughs> <laughs> um, anybody else have a different view of who might be responsible? I'm going to come up here and then I'm going to come to you, Paul. Yeah. All right. Hello. Hello. Um, I think that the science communicator obviously has some responsibility, but there is the scientist on one end and the journalist on the other, and they're both also very responsible. Okay. I'm seeing lots of nods in the audience. We all agree with this. Does anybody strongly disagree with this? No? Okay. I'll come over to you, Paul. What, what's the... What's the, um, what's the mood yeah, on the street yeah, on the, the internet? On the um, well, we've got a really interesting uh, comment from Joe Lewis, who says, no science is done by just one person. Who else was writing the original journal paper and had a proper chat with Joe? Who peer-reviewed it? Could the journal comment too? Thank you. Very good. I'm going to come to you, Cara. Oh, look at the nods from there. Uh, <laughs> uh, any thoughts from your group there? Anything you'd like to contribute of who might be responsible? Uh, yes, so there was a an, uh, an general consensus that everybody had a certain level of responsibility, but it kind of went, you know, top down from the uh, professor doing the original down to the scientist communicator and the journalist. Okay. All right. So now let's talk about the moments in the story where if Fiona, the science communicator, did something differently, if she did something differently, how could we change the outcome? We've had a chat about it. We're going to go into the interactive part of the show now. So we're going to go back to the very first scene that you saw. And as the scene plays out, I'm going to welcome my live audience to put a hand up and say, stop, if you think that the character could do something differently. So that's the invitation for those in the room. For those online, Cara's going to wait frantically, and that's going to let me know that she wants someone in that space wants to stop. And those that are, are streaming from home, you can say stop in the comments, and um, Paul may pick and make a comment, and Paul will pick that up, OK? So those live here, we just need to practice because sometimes um, people are a bit shy and it doesn't stop the action. So we need a very firm, loud, clear stop with me. Hand up and a stop. Ready? Practice. One, two, three. Stop! stop! Right. Fantastic. Yeah, you got that. All right. Brilliant. Um, OK, so we're going to go from the top of the play. It is um, the professor's just done three lectures in a row. He's got a plane to catch to go to his conference, and Fiona wants to have a word. Let's watch. And we'll see you all on Tuesday for quantum chemistry. That'll be good fun, eh? Professor, hi. Hi, Fee. Hi. Um, caught the end of that. Seemed interesting. Nobody was asleep. That's good. Um, hey, congratulations on that new paper. Oh, it's so exciting to have some runs on the board yes. in these times of uni cuts. Absolutely. Especially well nature. Done. Yeah, nature chemistry. Well done. Um, I reckon we should capitalise on that and uh, maybe get something out to the media. What do you think? Sure. The more exposure we can get for the lab, the better. Absolutely. OK, um, so just to help me out a little bit, could you give me maybe like a two sentence summary about what the paper's about? Well, the really important thing is the mechanism. Right. Because it's, it's a new mechanism we've never seen before and it can go in all kinds of different directions. It can sometimes produce tiny amounts, 0.1% or up to 10% uh -huh. of nastoids, fastoids, lastoids, castoids or doids. Right. You mentioned nast... Stop! Stop! Okay, I'm going to get fit. Just a minute. <laughs> da, 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 
Hello. <laughs> I actually can't give you the microphone okay. because of COVID, so I'm yeah. going to stand here and we'll talk together. I'll try not to spray. Um, <laughs> ask him what makes the difference. So we want to know what makes the difference. Yeah, between, okay. between point 0.1 and the 10. Okay, so we're going, to, we're going to go back a little bit and we're just going to ask what makes the difference. Mm -hmm. Professor, hi. Okay, let's watch. Professor, hi, how hi. are you doing? Oh, good, thanks. That's really good. Congratulations on the new paper. Thank you. Nature is great to have on the CV right now. I know. So good. Well done. Hey, um, I reckon we can capitalise on that and maybe get something out to the media. What do you think? Oh, great idea. More exposure for the lab, the better. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Hey, um, so to help me out, could you just give me maybe a one, two sentence summary? So it's all about this new mechanism we've found and uh, it, it's very sensitive to parameters and if sometimes it'll be 0.1% tiny amounts or 10% mm -hmm. of nastoids, fastoids, lastoids, castoids, frastoids or toids. Okay, so you've got on the one hand 0.1% and on the other hand 10% yep. and they're releasing potentially these toxic compounds. What's the threshold there? What's the difference between the two? What makes one so small, one so big. Well, it's a real combination of all the different parameters. You can have like the pH, the acid base side of it. You can uh -huh. have the temperature in which it's happening. Um, even you get some uh, catalytic effects from the, the vessel it's in, you know, surface chemistry on the, uh, if it's metallic versus glass, if you've got uh, any form of uh, ruptures on the glass, you know, so, surface. So what you're saying is there needs to be very specific conditions? Absolutely, yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. And you can engineer it. So if you wanted to make nastoids, you really could. Oh, interesting. All right. Okay, well, I think, I think that's the angle I'm going to focus on. Um, can I write something up and maybe send it through for approval? Stop. Okay, freeze. Thank you. Oh, stop, stop, stop. Good. All right. Uh, round of applause for, for the actors. Well done. Did that have the effect that you were hoping it would have? Well, no, because he, he, he wasn't giving her any examples and um, I didn't know how many stops I was allowed to have, but if I had a second stop, I would have said, give me an example. Tell me how it works. Tell me how it works. Okay. All right, so thank you very much for that. Let's have... Um, we, had, we had some extra... Um, don't, don't need this. We had some extra um, calls for stop and I, I probably do need to... Uh, just confirm with you the rules is that once we're in an intervention, we can't stop it. Um, but then, but hold your stops, that's good. And then we'll, we'll talk more. So, I'm wondering who, I'm wondering if we, if we try one more time. And would you be interested in showing us how she needs to speak to this professor? Yes, come on down, come on down. <laughs> Now, I didn't ask you, uh, what was your name? Lyndall. Now I can give this to you. Are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Lyndall, um, where do you want to take the scene from? <coughs> just from the start? Uh, no, just I think when you're saying to me, um, when you're saying to Fiona, um, well, it can switch from point one to ten. Okay. All right. So sometimes... This uh, mechanism, depending on your, your parameters, can be give you low levels, 0.1% or up to 10% of fastoids, lastoids, nastoids, castoids or toids. Wow, what makes the difference? Uh, the acid um, environment, what the pH is, uh, the temperature can have a big role as well. Um, if you've got any other things on the side, you know, uh, the catalytic effects of the surface, a lot of things happen with proteins on the surface, really messing around with things. Um, they're just a couple of the things I can think of. So, like, where would you see those differences? Oh, look, uh, you know, in, in the lab, we can try all of them, you know. We, we actually set the experiment up to be what we want. Okay, but when, it, when it's out there, where, yep. where, where, you know, some, where would be somewhere where you'd see that difference? So... Where's, where would the 10% be? Uh, well, the 10% would be in a process... Let me... I need to go back to the paper here because uh, 
can't remember every permutation and combination. But uh, look, I say, so we got 10% with um, over 55 degrees Celsius. Uh, when it happens slowly, um, over a sort of two-hour period, um, with a pH slightly acidic, about four. Um, but if you went into high pH, um, alkaline, then, then it kind of cut it right back. Um, the lower temperature obviously slowed it down as well. So, uh, you know, you, you're getting the, the sort of exothermic effect there. So, what's it used for? Um, so, this is... Um, well, this, this process is kind of a byproduct that happens in many... Um, yeah, manufacturing of polymers, for example. Oh, okay. So yep. would that happen when it's being uh, Professor, manufactured? you're going to miss your flight. Oh, yeah. Would that happen when, it, when it's being manufactured? Um, uh, it could do, yeah, yeah. Yep, all kinds of things are possible. Yeah, I've really got to make it to the airport, okay. sorry. <laughs> so I'll just chase up one of your co-authors. Uh, yep, sure. Um, so you can see on there, uh, Toi Puang Nat Tran and Anushto Taku. Okay. Um, their, their emails are there. Thanks. Okay. See you. See ya. <laughs> so, got, to, um, got something to wipe it with? Yeah, I've got some wipes. So, um, I'm just going to ask you a few questions before you put the microphone down. So, uh, did you achieve everything you were hoping to achieve? Uh, well, I'll have to find out when I speak to the, 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 the two co-authors, but I got a sense that it's used for things that are manufacturing, and that made me think, okay, so this has actually got a real-world application. A real-world application, all right. He, he used the word manufacturing. Yeah. That made me think about that. Okay. Thank you, Lyndall. Give uh, our first intervener a big round of applause. Now, Maria, I think I heard you call out stop earlier on. Am I correct? Did I hear that from you? Yeah, but because because Stephanie was uh, did the stop before me, and she she was not heard. Oh, <laughs> so you were. Oh, I give my word to her. <laughs> you gave your voice to Stephanie in Kenya. Thank you. Yes. So Stephanie, oh. you you called out stop just when um, the professor said I I have to go. Uh, what what were your thoughts at that point? Um, so my thoughts were uh, he's busy, but I was about to say um, scratch what I said before. I think I need more than two minutes or three minutes to do this. If you can send me an email on key points a public or a normal person should know of, or if we could postpone the article and set up a meeting to do this later, I think it will be good because I really want to capture what people should know. So I think uh, if you're able to send me an email on the key points or if you prefer later on we set up a meeting, that would be great. Okay, so thank you, Stephanie, thank you. So asking for an email with key points, how it's applying to the real world and setting up a meeting that's not between a lecture and a, and a flight to the airport. <laughs> I think you've solved some really good problems there. I'm interested if there are any science professors online or in the room the question I have for science professors is what is pulling on your time? How does time work in that industry? Um, <laughs> and, and I guess um, I guess I'm interested to see is it is that is that something that happens a lot that you're getting called to um, called from one thing to another and in the middle there's a conversation about. Um, science communication, or do you have in your employment the space to have meetings and to write those emails, or are they happening sort of after after dinner at night as an extra thing that you do in your career? I'm kind of interested. Everything is fine. Everything. Say that again for us at so home. So everything is rushed. So a quick meeting like that very likely has happened many times. I would try to do it after midnight, but it might not be very good. Might not be very good. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think it's a great solution, Stephanie, but I also think the time pressures nowadays in academics particularly is quite remarkable. Um, we've got to move now to our second scene. Uh, which is a scene um, between where uh, Fiona, a science communicator, is writing the article. 
And in this scene, you may notice that the language starts to change. So I want you to call out stop, uh, particularly those that are online. I'm interested in seeing if we can work with those online. Um, calling out stop if you think we could do anything a little bit different in this scene. Let's watch. OK, half an hour. This has got to be good. Don't forget the mechanism. It's the heart of the science. Boring. I need to make it snappy. OK, all right. Researchers at the university have recently discovered a possible link. Wishy washy, who would publish that? Okay. Uh, researchers at the university have recently discovered uh, a link between the breakdown of plastics and the release of 0.1 to 10% of nastoids. And fastoids, castoids, lastoids, bastoids, <laughs> and toids. But how does it affect people? People want to read about themselves. Stop. 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 All right, here I come. Here she comes, coming around. Hi, what's your name? Hi, I'm Shelby, and I said stop because this is my personal bugbear. Um, let's talk about risk for a minute here. Um, even science communicators um, have a really poor understanding of risk and um, trying to get an idea of what 0.1% to 10% actually means in the environment. Um, and then conveying it to people, you can't say it's a 0.1% chance or, or whatever it is. It just, you can't do that. You've got to actually put it into some kind of um, thing they understand. Thank you. Do you know how to do that? Yes. <laughs> um, no, not so good on chemistry myself, more of a geographer, but um, um, I would be trying to link it to, if we know how many thingamabobs are made in a year, how many of them would produce a nastoid. So actually talk about the numbers of things that are actually produced. Um, um, and may, or maybe, if not numbers, then the quantity of stuff that is produced. It's not just about the 0.1% or the 10%. 10% of 0 0.00001 mil is still bugger all. So, you know, you actually need to talk hard numbers, things that people can visualise. Thank you. Oh, Paul's got his hand up. What, what are they saying out, yeah, out in the a, real world? Well, <laughs> there's a raging conversation happening in the YouTube comments uh, <laughs> at the moment, uh, but I'll pick out one of uh, the comments. I got a stop from Super Sparkleton, who said, <laughs> maybe this work wasn't ready for a news article yet. The science communication could have looked into the broader picture first then she would have found out about the factory, etc. Right. Lots of people nodding. So we need to... Can you read that out again for me? Because I yep. momentarily stopped listening. Go again. So <laughs> maybe this work wasn't ready for a news article yet. The science communicator could have looked into the broader picture first. Then she would have found out about the factory and Petersburg or Petersville, <laughs> yep. etc. Great. Okay. Thank you. So what we might try is applying, what was your name again? Sorry. Shelby. Shelby's technique of actually giving us what that figure might truly look like into the document. And then um, taking out anything that might produce risk. Can we try that? Yep. <laughs> She met me on Monday. She's regretting it right now. Um, hi, Linda. Let's watch. All right, so I've only got half an hour. Oh, gonna make this good. All right. Researchers at the university have recently discovered a new mechanism where nastoids get produced up to Ten percent. Wishy washy. Who's going to read that? Exactly. And ten percent of what? 
All right, okay. Maybe I need to look up nastoids. Just an idea. <laughs> Why are you writing this article if you don't even know what they do? Very good point. <laughs> okay, all right, Googling, here we go. The important thing for our lab is the chemistry. Don't get pulled off into other stuff. We want to focus on our chemical prowess. That's what's going to get us the points in the ARC reviews. That's boring. <laughs> Nobody even knows what an ARC review is. The ARC reviewers do. <laughs> and how many ARC reviewers are there? Too bloody many. <laughs> All right, so it turns out nastoids, the polyubiquitous, that's the plastic that the professor was talking about. So they're produced in, or they're used in the manufacture of thingamabobs. Okay. Okay, okay, that could be a good angle. Um, all right, all right, let's try this. Researchers at the university have recently discovered a possible link between the release of toxic nastoids and... Toxic, yes, go with toxic. <laughs> yeah, that one was pretty good. All right, toxic nastoids and um, the manufacture of thingamabobs. Is that... How does that affect people, though? Yeah, that's People kind of the question, People want to read about themselves. It? Yeah, they do want to read about themselves, but I don't want to cause panic. I'm going to ask one of our characters a question, because it's bugging me. Science communicator, and perhaps scientist, what is the motivation for putting this story out in the first place? I want to do my job. And for you, scientist? Uh, Fiona told me it's a good thing. For me, you know, and the head of department's pretty keen on us getting media stuff, but for me, it's about getting in nature. That's big points for me. I've got to get my teaching done. That's a pain in the ass, but I've got some great contacts I'm about to make at the conference. Media release? What media release? Mm. And so, why is media good? to get as a scientist? Media is good because it gets attention for our lab. So a question particularly for those online, why is media good for scientists? Why do you want attention in the media for your lab? Uh, we're going to let that sit. For a few, have you got any responses yet? I'm assuming that takes like a minute or two, seven seconds at least. So we will go to scene number three now, please. So we're going to scratch all the interventions we've had so far, and we're now going to the scene where Sam... Oh, Kara! Kara! <laughs> Hi, Hi, Ellie! Hi! What can I do for you? We have an intervention already for this scene. Maria would really like to intervene um, in this scene. This, this scene that we're doing now, the, the, the meet, okay. The scene that we're Mar doing right now with the phone call between the science communicator and the journalist. And um, Maria, who, who do you want to play in this scene? Oh, I wasn't thinking of playing anybody, but I'm trying. <laughs> um, um, the science communicator. You're going to play the science communicator, great. So our minds are just going to zip you from there down to the chair, and you're on the phone. Perhaps okay. it's a Zoom call. Let's watch. <clears throat> uh, hi, Fiona. Hi. Uh, it's huh. just Sam from the paper here. Um, I was just wanting to grab a quote from Professor Theo about that um, nastoid discovery release you just sent out. Yes, um, uh, he's not here at the moment. Uh, he's, uh, he's flying, so he's not available. Right. Um, when, um, well, yeah. if I could grab a quote from you, that would be great as well. I just need a quote so we can kind of run the story out as fast as possible. I, I'm not comfortable doing that because it's not my topic. But um, how about, when do you need to publish this to uh, be effective? 
about 20 minutes. My editor's really on me. We've just got a slot that's opened up and I can get you the exact press that you want. I just need a quote so we can run it. Is it possible to delay it for a week or something? So to I have mean, it on the next and uh, next edition? Because uh, um, I'm afraid that it's going to go bad. bad. I, I mean, mean that, that it's, it's not, not going to be the, the best um, press that, we, that we're going to get without this quote. Look, Pete, you shouldn't worry about that. All press is good press. You've come to me about this before, right? <laughs> Remember that, Professor? That yeah, I'm, I'm not that comfortable doing that. So I would prefer, oh, either, what about if I can try to get him on the phone now and... Uh, uh, yes, yeah, you could grab him on the phone, like, right now. That would be ideal. But if not, yes, but we're... It, but if not, I prefer to delay it uh, some, some time, even if the press is not that good. Sorry, just cut out for a second. I didn't quite catch that last part. I would prefer to delay for a week or for some time, if the press, even if the press is not that good. Look. OK, thank you to Maria. <laughs> Paul. <laughs> OK, Maria, I'm going to talk to you in a minute. I'm going to go to Paul now because things are going hot. Yeah, how long have you got? Um, <laughs> uh, let me let me pick a couple of uh, the comments, and this was in answer to your question about why is media good for uh, for scientific uh, research. Jessica Coates said, "Isn't it good to try to connect um, to people, just to share and communicate?" Joe Lewis said, "Exactly, media should be for the public. Why uh, would people want to hear about this? What is the angle of the public interest? It's not just the toxicity. Also, university chemistry having a real impact. So there's a shared impact when stories are told through the media." There are many more uh, comments, but there's one more I'll read out from Aldo Leal, who says, communication equals visibility. Visibility is sometimes needed for getting funds and ah. for doing uh, easier the publication of our papers in order to get more funds. Hmm, what if money ruled the world? Wait, <laughs> it already does. Right, okay, thank you. Maria, in that scene, did you get to say everything you wanted to say? Uh, am I muted or not? No, we know. can hear you. Good, good, good. Um, um, yes, more or less. That, that was my idea, yes. Okay, so... I, I think if... Yeah. Yeah, that's good. So we've got... I guess we've got a bit of tension here, haven't we? We've got the, this idea of exposure, it's good for funding, you can't do the science without the money. Uh, the media, the pressure in the media, pressure for you. You've got your boss on your back trying to get the article out. And we've got the pressure to make sure we do it right from the scientist and science communicator. I wonder what would happen if we delay releasing this information. Can you turn to the person? I've got a very, very excited nod. Um, hold on, I'm coming over. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's your name? Hi, my name is Linus. Linus, why are you so excited about delaying? Well, because that is definitely a very good idea. Um, because I guess with such like sensitive information that could escalate, um, as our science communicator found out when she was researching. Um, it's pretty good if she has another week to actually find out exactly what she wants to say and be more careful with it. Yeah, okay. So we're thinking a good solution would be a week. We take a break for a week. Uh, is, that, is that a consent? Are we getting nods? We, we don't agree. What do we need to do now? Another hand, I'm coming. The thing is, if she wanted to delay, she should have done that before she put the media release out because now the journalist has spent time on it. The relationship with the journalist is extremely important to the science communicator and if the journalist can't run that story, they've just wasted their time, they're going to get in trouble from their editor and that relationship will be damaged. Ba bow <laughs> Okay. All right. We're going to move on now. <laughs> OK, so let's pretend none of these fantastic offers and inter interventions have happened. And Sam has released the news. Uh, the newspaper's taken it, run with it, and um, it's hit 
Petersville. And we're now going to have the scene between our mayor and Stefan. And once again, if at any point you want to stop the action, uh, yeah, yeah, why not? If at any point you want to stop, <laughs> she says stop, I haven't started, I'm coming, I'm coming. Oh, maybe, actually, no, come on down. Can you come on down? <laughs> yeah. Give her a round of applause, please. Now, what's your name? I'm Candice. Candice, there we go. And who would you like to play, Candice? Uh, I'd like to play the worker. The worker. Okay, Candice, uh, step in <laughs> to Stefan. Sorry to take your limelight. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. Um, so we're going to watch this through with no, no stops. We're going to see what happens. Um, and the only thing I'm going to allow you to do is that if you think, uh, Candice, that Candice does anything that Stefan just wouldn't do, it's totally out of character, um, I want you to call out magic. Okay? <laughs> All right. So, Candice, when you do this, you're going to need to put the mic on your chin like it's an ice cream. That's it. Nice and close. It feels weird, I know. Okay. Let's watch. He's the mayor. Just call, call him the mayor. <laughs> hey, mayor, have you seen... Oh, I have seen it, too, Stefan. Okay. So... Oh, look, uh, I'm in again on top of this. I'm going okay. to talk to Bruce at the plant. Right. This afternoon. Okay. All right. Uh, I'm going to tell you what I want to do, if mm -hmm. that's okay. Um, so, as a person that's directly affected by this, as a towns member, as a parent with a child that's had an illness, yeah. and friends with other parents that have had children with illnesses, what I'd like to do is um, look past that this is a media story. As adults, we should never believe what we're reading in the media. Um, and these tests are done in a laboratory. So what I'd like to do, or if, what I'd like you to do, is to invite the lead scientist to come to our town mm -hmm. and run some tests on our factory. Um, that could immediately give us answers. <laughs> give us answers, and then also give answers to other similar factories. Uh, it's good for everyone. Yeah. The university will get more attention, the test will get more attention, the town gets more attention, and the media get another story. Is that really what we want for the town, Stefan? Um, I think it would be groundbreaking to say, this town has stepped up, and on behalf of other factories, we want to see what's happening and provide the... <laughs> oh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> That's <laughs> my son. <laughs> oh, it's your son. <laughs> And on the eve of Mother's Day. How could you? I did get an early Mother's Day present yesterday. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so just before, we, before you start, before you start, one come down for me. Come down. Okay, son. Uh, you'll sh uh, because you're in the same household, I'm going to assume, if you could share the mic with Mum. Yeah, no worries. Why, why are you calling magic on this moment? Sophia has just lost a child, and... No. Yeah. Oh, yep, yeah. just lost a child, which means, an emotional standpoint, the ability to restrain yourself to be calm and collected and not immediately jump to a conclusion, especially the day or even the week afterwards, is already out of character. To be calm and collected in that situation takes an, an incredible level of resilience, mm. which, as we've seen in the previous skit, was not being shown. Apologies. <laughs> 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 so, to be able to do that right after that happens seems out of character, and it would be very out of character for, I would say, most people. I Unless think I'd... Uh, well, let's find out. What Do we agree? Do we think it's out of character for... Is it out of... Hands on heads if you think it's out of character for Stefan to come in so calmly with, oh, I haven't even given you the other option. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. However, I must say I'm quite impressed with the offer that, that this... Um, that Can, uh, Candice is, is giving... Can we have a chat online, face to face? Who might be the person in the town? It's not going to be Stefan, he's too emotional. Who might be the person in this town 
who does have this conversation with the mayor. Have a chat. Who is it going to be? And um, let's give these two a big round of applause too. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yep. I'll go straight to you. <laughs> and then we'll talk in the space. I just had a couple of really great comments from Lisa Jo Epstein. <clears throat> Lisa said that, think of the countless mothers who have lost a child to gun violence and how they step up and call out what is happening. So um, Lisa says, or Lisa Jo says, uh, that not necessarily wouldn't be able to make a rational call and, and step up and, and call it out. Mm. And Lisa Jo also says, Stefan should organise the community so that he isn't the only one speaking out against the thingy plant and the only one the mayor points out for exaggerating the toxicity of the plant. Right. Lovely offer. Thank you, Online World. Thank you. Any other thoughts? Just shouting out, and I will repeat so that we can hear online. Gentlemen up here towards the back, who? The leader of the union. The leader of the union. Ooh. <laughs> who do we agree? Oh, snaps for those who agree. Lovely. All right. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, yes? I think it would be uh, the regulatory firm in that town for the most responsible because that would be a way where people would manage the Okay, hold on. I'll just I'll just refeed that. So the regula regulatory body represent representative. Do we agree? Yeah. Okay. Another hand. There's a less less slightly less clicking or slower clicking. It's just we're not quite as sure. Just here. Stefan's child's doctor. Ooh, what do we think? Ooh, yeah. Oh, we got some high clicks. <laughs> Anybody else? We have union. Yes? I think um, the mayor's contact sign representative usually can get to the bottom of it, not just the representative, like not just the head of the plan. Um, yes, mayor. <laughs> I don't really order. <laughs> you should. <laughs> should we see that? Oh, yes, hold on. Oh, just sorry, just wanted to confirm there was another comment here. This was, again, Super Sparkleton uh, going off on, on the YouTube comments. Uh, why is there not a health professional in this picture? So just echoing. Yeah, uh, where point. is the health professional? Right, okay. So, well, Ali. Yes. Oh, Cara. Hi. Hi. Yes, I, we've got a few here that haven't been said as well, um, okay. which is uh, the teachers and educators who are working with the children and noticing changes, as well as someone in the factory who's working in safety or quality control, because that's really their job. <coughs> right. Yeah, someone in the factory. Okay, so I'm wondering if we should call the town meeting and, and maybe you can help Stefan out a bit in the town meeting. So let's see if we can role play together. <laughs> I want you to take on a person in the town of Petersville. And you could be the medical person. You could be a mother, a father. You could be a worker in the factory. There are a lot of workers in the factory. You could be a union person. Yes. Hold on. Come on up. Come on down. Uh, 
I can... Should I hold yeah, it? Yeah, you can hold okay. it. Okay. Wouldn't the CEO actually try to hire other scientists in order to actually try to oppose said a theory? What <laughs> a clicking going on. I think our future's in safe hands. <laughs> Yes, hold on, another, another word from the under 25s. Can I? You can. Yeah, okay. Um, I was just wondering, was the child that Stefan lost Ruby? The child that Stefan lost was Ruby? Yes. Yes. Okay, and in the town meeting, could someone be, say, one of Ruby's friends to back up Stefan? That's a great idea. Let's try it. Okay, um, we're going to have a town meeting. All right. We're going to have a town meeting. I feel a bit for the, for the mayor, but anyway, we are going to have a town meeting. <laughs> so Good I luck. encourage you. Good um, luck, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> um, I encourage you to raise your hand before you speak, but you know, whatever happens, happens. Let's watch. Resistance. Um, hi. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our meeting tonight. This is a very <laughs> dangerous time, a very distressing time in our town, with a lot of dangerous talk going around. I'm sure you've all read the newspaper accounts about potential difficulties of manufacturing at the plant. I've spoken with Bruce. You all know Bruce as the CEO of our plant. Bruce is on top of all the science checks, and I've asked Bruce to speak to us tonight. Bruce is really the most relevant person. He's doing all of the check checking it. Who? Is there someone that you feel I should speak to? Well, you're the mayor. You should know. <laughs> Who's the regulator? The regulatory body. Is the regulatory body present here at the town meeting? Oh, come on down, please. <laughs> Um, we're really glad you could come and speak tonight. Can you give the town people some information that they need to know? And just as you speak, just keep the microphone up as though it's a very delicious ice cream, really close to the mouth. I will try. What's the regulator's name? Lick it. Uh, regulator. <laughs> regulator. Um, well, in my opinion, uh, I guess it is important um, as an environmental toxicologist uh, for us to do, t do some tests and verify some documents uh, and also any QMS, which is nothing but a quality management system from um, the CEO itself in for his manufacturing facility um, and trying and seeing if there what is anything... What she's trying to say is that we need to get our safety staff onto it, which we have done, because I assure you that any toxicity in this environment is toxicity for me and my family. I would not let that happen. I repeat, not... We, absolutely. My safety staff and the regulator have very close relationship. They regularly do inspections and we welcome that and I would welcome that now. Yes, we would absolutely do more tests which would be pending and then based on which we are going to take the responsibility and work with the mayor and yourself and for the public. So what do you know about OIDS? <laughs> <laughs> the question is, what do you know about nastoids? OIDS? Nastoids. Well... As if now we know that there is a potential toxicity, but has there been any specific biological implications with human toxicity? Three dead kids! Not been Three dead kids! How specific do you want to be? Absolutely. So which is why it's, it's in the adverse outcome pathway, which means that it's going into a quick signaling pathway and we have developed a particular body separated out to develop more inputs and looking at toxicity. Regulator, you know as well as I do yes. that the coroner came down with a uh, genetic disease. It was not poison. The coroner did a full examination. Well, we we, had an we are talking about nastoids, which are um, toxicity levels coming from the manufacturing unit. It is a human-made outcome, so you will have to... So, so you're telling me the coroner was wrong? You're telling me the, the, the medical I professionals we, uh, in the inquest did not do diligence? I think we're talking different terminologies The GPs they have no idea what it was. 
Now, we certainly do understand that's exactly why we're taking the, the, the hey, responsibility. Who's leaving? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, usually that is the regulatory um, uh, process in which, but that would, it's not a decision that I make, it would be a panel decision that we would be making. Uh, maybe this is about buying some more time, that about at least a week's time before we can make that such decision, yes. It's a very bad suggestion, very dangerous for the town. Excuse. It's, look, I, I, I would try to protect it. I would try to protect it as your CEO, I would not want to lose anyone. Excuse me, but we'd like to make a point, please. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just curious. There's so much going on and I'm a little bit confused. Is there going to be like a um, mini tree turn so that we go discuss further with the people we know who can have more information about this? Is there recording a secretary uh, or is it just a discussion and we're going home? Mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> Have we got someone keeping records? <laughs> Mayor, you're uh, keeping records of this, of course, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> I thought you had your people. How will you there, share right? them? How will you share the records, Mayor? I'm going to email uh, the the union. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Why not the council the website, mate? The council website. <laughs> No, you go to the, uh, say, for example, the Therapeutic Goods Administration webpage for public release before we can make any decision. Yes. And how long I will think... that take? Yeah. How long will that take? Close the factory now. Conflict of interest. It's very dangerous. And what if you just move the factory away from site? We also have another point here. Thank you. <laughs> You're doing great. Uh, uh, I've got, I've got a, the, the voice of uh, one of Ruby's childhood friends. Did you want to say something? <laughs> well, I knew Ruby very well, and I know that the no nastoids <laughs> were a part of her departure to this world, and I know that what. Because I was very close friends with her and I was there with Stefan when she died. And I know, and I talked to the nurses and I asked them what was the reason and they said that it was because nastoids were found in her blood source and in her lungs. So I know that um, if we keep this factory running that there is a threat to all of the people in this town. Oh, wow. <laughs> Magic. <laughs> Stefan. Yeah? <laughs> you never mentioned that there might be a medical proof that Narsoids killed Ruby. Is that true or is that maybe just the memory of a young person? Look, all I remember is the doctor just saying that he'd never seen anything like this before and had no idea what it was. Let's vote. So, do you think that Ruby may have passed away because of the impact of the toxins of nastoids? Or do you think we don't know? Hands on heads if you think she definitely did. Hands on in the air if you just don't care. Don't know, if you don't know. <laughs> Hands in the air if you just don't know. <laughs> okay. So we're going to bring the story back to the uncertainty. We don't know. It's not proven that this is what has taken the life of Ruby and two other children over the last two years in town. Um, do your scientists, can they equivocally say that it wasn't nastoids? Unequivocally? Thank Un you. Unequivocally. Thank you. 
I'm not a lawyer. I'm who are you asking here? I'm asking uh, Bruce. This is Bruce. Look, uh, my people have been doing safety for us for 25 years and we have an unblemished safety record. They have seen every possible thing that can go wrong on that production line. We have chillers break down, we have uh, suppliers give us bad chemicals and they pick it up like that because they've seen everything that can go wrong. And <coughs> as far as... They have ever seen, they have not seen, I mean, they've picked up many, many things that have gone wrong, but they have not ever seen any evidence for nastoids. How do we support, how do we support the workers? How can we get this together as a community? I'm going to pause for a second and I'm going to ask you to transform into the scientists, please. <laughs> That's a jacket for that. <laughs> Magic. <laughs> I'm a hot scientist, I can't find my job. <laughs> we're going to uh, we're gonna take some of the suggestions that we had and we're gonna imagine that the mayor actually invites the scientist to the town meeting and creates a town meeting at a time when the scientist can actually attend. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and here we have the scientist. Hello, <laughs> um, Professor Theo. Um, listen, we've got some uncertainty in the town. I've got, uh, there are people that have questions for you. The first question I want to ask is, can you tell me unequivocally <laughs> that Ruby's death was not related to nastoids? Oh, I'm not a medical professional, I'm an analytical chemist. I could not say that, no. I could not say one way or the other. You'd, you'd, you'd really need to, I mean, go... Presumably there was a coronial inquest. Yeah. If three people have died, then how can, has there been any investigation? Has there been any investigation into each individual person's passing? I guess that's a question for the I, Mayor. I'm not a member of the town, so Mayor? Well, according to the coroner, they were all separate and not related. Has there been like any reports? I don't know. Official, Official investigations, yeah. Just the just the coroner's inquest. Yep. So the question from the floor the is: here? Are they? Was the coroner able to test for nastoids? There was no indication that that was that that test was necessary. No. Okay. Oh, everybody wants to talk. Okay, I'm going up here. Oh, and someone online. Okay, let's go with let let's go online first as I catch my breath. So someone Cara, here too, Ellie. Oh. Yeah, Cara, what's happening up there? Uh, Lewis, go ahead. Hi, I can come in. Um, I think we're going to have to look at this in, from a more international perspective as well. So we've talked about that. Obviously, emotions are high. It's called nastoids. There's lots of theories in the air. But you, we've already, this is not the only factory that's doing this type of work as well. And so actually, perhaps not just taking an individual look, but actually population level studies. Are there other things in other factories that have similar processes that we've talked? Are, are our competitors, do, are some of the things happening as well? Uh, can we bring in the reviewers? Conveniently, I'm in Edinburgh, so I can go and knock on the door because the presumed neighbors. Uh, can we bring in, make sure this is independent and international? Thank you, Lewis. Uh, up here, there was someone with their hand up. Something they wanted to ask. Go over this way, okay. In light that the coroner could not test for nastoids, would there be, uh, has the individuals who have passed away been sent or have um, data on their um, causes of death been sent to professionals or other sort of to proof, like read or proof check the sort of uh, cause of death? No, we were satisfied with the town coroner's findings. <laughs> I mean, they would call in medical professionals. Wouldn't they, regulator? Yes, the regulator says yes. Just a question from here. 
Hi. Um, I did go back and read the newspaper article again and, and I went and read the paper that you wrote and I didn't quite understand the mechanism. Could you explain that to me? And is that like a new technique that measures nas- like these different types of things and, and how much impact do you think they might have? Is it, is it different from the old way? Would that make a difference to where, how we can measure things now? Uh, it's not about measurement. It's about a chemical reaction that nobody had realised was happening. Uh, so now we know that that reaction can happen in some circumstances and we don't know... Uh, you need to know the very precise details of those... Uh, what's happening in the experiment. Yeah? Do you have any of those sort of safety measures that you can plug into your lab and recreate? Uh, look, that would be a job for me to talk to the factory about, I guess. Okay, we've got Maybe question. we should have you talking to the factory, Professor. Where's Bruce? He was here. Go. <laughs> okay, so we're going to go up to Cara first, and then um, we've got a question over here. So, Cara, uh, Agnes, go ahead. Yes, I've got a question, please. I'm not sure who the right one to answer it is, but I'd like to know if it would be possible to measure the level of NASLO production in the factory now so that we can start looking forward and working out how much of a risk we're dealing with. Okay, yes, we've got snaps above the, ear, above the heads. So, um, so is, uh, this is the question really for... Son. <laughs> it was always going to happen. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so, Professor Theo, you want to come into the lab? Sure. I'd be happy to come in and run some tests for you. Uh, can I work with your safety staff? I guess so, but we'll want to keep this under wraps. We don't want this getting out to the media. We don't want another panic. All right, well, uh, I'll get some of my guys down there and we'll uh, really... Can you give me access to all your labs? Jeez. You'll have to sign an agreement not to spread anything to those Kenyans. <laughs> uh, yeah, sure, I'm happy to do that. Um, we'll need to uh, work out an agreement with the university's IP as well. They'll probably want to publish it. Oh, we can't have people publishing this data. Well, the Vice-Chancellor might not be very impressed with that. <laughs> I'm just going uh, that very uh, I'm impressed even if the vice chancellor <laughs> isn't I'm impressed so uh, we've got a question here yeah Phil it's a question for the scientist um, yeah it's <laughs> probably, probably the blue, blue one <laughs> So is it known whether the nestoids are actually the only substance that's toxic or can the toys or the frostoids also be toxic or uh, in another way, is there an interna- interaction between um, some of the other substances that can be toxic uh, to humans as well in high levels? It's such a complicated mechanism. There could be all <laughs> kinds of things. I mean, you know, the, by the time you throw in three or four variables that can all change, you get an almost infinite number of possibilities. <sighs> Um, in terms of what we've established, uh, fastoids, lastoids, I, do you know what? I think maybe we should find a toxicologist to be on my next paper. <laughs> we've got another question. Do you know any? <laughs> <laughs> uh, one, uh, two, time for two more questions. Here we go. Question here. Uh, my question is for the scientist. Uh, from the first scene, I'm just wondering whether this paper is more about the science or more about you keeping your tenure at the university. <gasps> I'm sure that never happened. Um, It uh, depends on who's listening. (laughs) (laughs) What what are the pressures like for you, Professor, to keep your job? Big pardon? What are the pressures like for you to keep your job? 
Oh, look, uh, there have been a lot of economic pressures on the university sector. We've had uh, a bunch of uh, international students drop out. So they're looking to cut costs. Uh, and for me to get something in nature right now is such a good thing for my career. I, I can't tell you, you know, because um, the guy down the road from me, um, uh, Thaku, he's in all sorts of trouble because he hasn't got a publication out. He had a, he had a really good mechanism looking really good and it, it just didn't get through the review process. And Tough. That's yeah. tough. But Can hopefully I... there's a job for him in Edinburgh. Can I add something there? <laughs> <laughs> Professor, it's all, the fact that you have a paper in Nature is also really good for me too. <gasps> so it's... Back to the science community. So can you say that again, science communicator? The fact that you have a paper in Nature is also really good for me too. Hmm. Last question for now. Do you, ha do you, ha you have the correct equipment? Actually, well, basically two questions. Okay, last two questions. <laughs> okay. Do you have the equipment to actually detect the nasties? Yes. Thank I mean, I, it's not portable. <laughs> All right, then. You need to have a big... Uh, 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 FTIR spectroscopy, you need to have a gas chromatograph, etc. Well, uh, I, don't, I don't see why our CEO wouldn't be happy to sponsor an autopsy performed on, on said child. After all, if he says he cares so much about us and says there's nothing to worry about, why should he be so worried about an autopsy? If you would have us exhume our young people. <laughs> can, can we just clarify the backstory here? So, um, so this townsperson is suggesting that we need an answer quickly, and to do that would be to test on Ruby. Who died when? Who died two years ago. Two years. Using your mechanism <laughs> to test. And the technology. And Mayor, your response is? Well, I think that's just an absolutely shameful suggestion. But we stop. I... Stefan. Stefan, how would you feel about us digging up Ruby? <laughs> it would tear my heart out. Maybe it's going to save more kids in this town than yes, all right. <laughs> Look. I feel that might not be the, the best approach if we can just really check every single part of the factory for Nastoid. That is the important thing. You know, even if there were some three years ago, and we'll really never know, but that's probably the smartest thing to do now is check. So, so uh, yeah, Bruce, I think you should shut down and check until it's fully clear. Okay. Thank you. Give yourselves a round of applause. Woo! That was quite the town hall meeting. <laughs> well done. Um, I'm going to ask my actors to just come back and stand in their original place. And as I do, uh, I want you to consider again, whose responsibility is it? to make sure that we're communicating science clearly. And if your answer has changed at all, I'd like you to just raise your hand. We've got one person. A few people. Um, there was definitely a lot of pressure originally on scientists and then a little bit of pressure on science communicator and um, journalist. But I'm kind of curious, no one mentioned the mayor before. And you know, he was under pressure up there. Yeah, yeah, so the mayor's come up. And what about Stefan? Yes. Oh my gosh, someone has to speak and I can't ignore the hand anymore. So what do you want to say? Um. To be honest, I think it's kind of all of them because they can all spread like the science news, like even Stefan and the mayor and like all of them. 
Um, adding on to that, uh, they all have um, like a voice in a way, and it's their responsibility to check it, um, double check it, and making sure they're getting it peer reviewed. And also, like for example, Stefan to read the article and maybe do backup research before. Before. Okay. What are our thoughts? Yeah. Uh, I'm not a big reader. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> this has brought us close to the end of our evening together, temporarily. Well, I guess we'll uh, close to the end of the forum part of the evening together. Um, and I'd like to go I go to um, Paul, who just took a very deep breath in. Do you want? Do you have something to say yet? No, not yet. So online. I want you to think about the themes and what you might take away from this evening's performance or this morning's performance, depending on where you are in the world. If you can think of a couple of words of what you're going to take away from today, those that are online, please type in the comments. And um, those with us here on Rendezvous, if you've got any words, just wave away. So I'll start with the audience that's here with us tonight, just shouting out words about what you will take away from the show this evening. Yep. I reckon what good science communication looks like in terms of this actual way of presenting science and the nature of science in this theatre. What good science communication could look like. Yeah. Is that what you mean? Yeah, that this is one way of good science. Sorry. Sorry. That this is um, one way of good science communication because we might not learn about one certain scientific concept here, but more about how science works. And so through this theatre and how you guys are doing it, actually we are learning. Forum theatre. Forum theatre, yes. Science communication, <laughs> yeah! <laughs> Woo! <laughs> well, I'm a bit biased, but yeah. <laughs> Okay, to Paul next. And okay, I'll... I've got a couple of comments here from online. Communication is the responsibility of the communicator, but it's a big responsibility, so everyone should do their part because science is so important. And a separate comment here from Carl, who says, follow the money. Sorry, we're having some technical issues. Thank you. Okay. Everyone has the responsibility, but not everyone has the ability ability to do it properly. They either don't understand the science or they don't understand the communication and um, a lot of people carry their own biases, including scientists, that can colour their view about what's important and how to convey something. Thank you. Any other... So emotion sells papers and personal stories sell papers and emotion can cloud science. So once you get the personal story in there, it's very difficult to separate the science from the emotion. So it was very sad that Ruby died, but there was really no clear uh, evidence that Ruby died due to nastoids, but there was assumptions. And, it, yeah, it's difficult once the emotion gets involved. So the journalists have to tread a very careful line between emotion um, to sell papers and the truth, which is, is the science. The other thing is explaining risk to people who don't have a scientific background is difficult. So in Stefan's town, most of his friends probably think their children's risk of dying from nastoids is very high when there may not be much scientific evidence of that. That, that's imp that was very good. Uh, I can't get to all of you, so I'd like you now, just while we're waiting for a few more comments from online and from Cara. Let's go to Cara first and then I'll... Yes, hello. Hello, can we be heard? Beautiful. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, so these guys have been having a great conversation uh, in the comments here. Um, and they say that this has brought up a lot of things for them. One is the culture of communication in our society um, and that the proof versus hypothesis 
are both re relevant, but it's a really interesting line that they need to walk, walk. Um, and that there needs to be independent forums which can build trust between the public stakeholders and scientists and that transparency is absolutely key. Um, and that everything needs to be slowed down. We need a better communication between the scientists and the communicator and the journalist to avoid panic. And we need to listen to people um, that get affected and consider their words, even if later they end up being wrong. Cool, thank you. Um, Paul, is there anything from online? There's lots. Yeah. Um, it's important to account for the true motivation of every single participant of the communication, especially in such long chains. And lots of comments just saying that they really uh, enjoyed this format to explore uh, this issue. Great. Well, that kind of leads us into the, the next part of the evening. So for those, um, for those that are online, I'm going to give you a couple of minutes now to go stretch your legs, um, have a stretch and come back after about uh, maybe three or four, two minutes, two minutes. You've got two minutes. Uh, and those here present this evening, your reward from be for being uh, someone that resides in Canberra is there is some delicious food available for you and some drinks available, after which uh, there will be a short Q&A about this process, about Forum Theatre, what it's like to participate in it, and any questions that you might have for um, the creative team. And I was going to let you say that. <laughs> That's okay. So if there's Shall anything you want to add, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Hi everybody, thank you so much for coming this evening. I'm Paul Richards, uh, Director of Communications at the Academy. Yes, as uh, Ali just said, please uh, head through to the Dorothy Hill Room if you're here in the Shine Dome this evening. Uh, there's some food and drink. There will be a live stream of the Q&A, so if you have food and drink, please watch the Q&A from uh, in there. If you're not eating or drinking, you're welcome to come back into the theatre and we'll be conducting a QA and a in just a couple of minutes. So uh, welcome, uh, thank you all for joining us this evening and stick around and we'll have a Q&A in just two minutes to everyone online. Do the same and we'll see you soon. Cool. <laughs> Let's go and have a, have a moment together. Oh, no. <laughs> Should we go to the green room? Let's go to the green room.
with our online audience as well. And uh, could, could we those who were in the Shine Dome and still enjoying a few uh, nibbles and a drink should be able to watch us as well. So welcome to you watching in the other room next door. So um, I'd first just like to um, say thank you so much to our cast and everyone involved in this production. It was an absolutely amazing uh, evening of forum <laughs> theatre. <laughs> had a great exploration of the challenges that face scientists and science communication. So I'd like to uh, introduce everyone that we have uh, sitting in chairs here now. Uh, we have first Professor Hans Bachor, who is a fellow of the Australian Academy of Science and Secretary for Education and the Public Awareness of Science. Welcome, Hans. Good evening. Uh, uh, next, we have uh, Ali Clinch. Uh, and Robin, uh, who are from Rebus Theatre, Robin Davidson, I apologise, Robin, I'd forgotten her surname, uh, who are also responsible for the theatre side of the production of this evening. So thank you very much to you both. Very welcome. Then we have uh, Phil Dooley, uh, Joanna Howes, uh, we have Linda Chen and Joel Swadling, who are our cast. Thanks so much. <clears throat> Hans, can I start by asking you, um, what did you make of this evening and an exploration of the, the issues? Oh, it got me riveted on my seat. I mean, this is real life. This is what happens in the world. Uh, science couldn't do without communication. And there's this long chain, how the message goes along. So I, I was very impressed with you setting the scenario, but then also letting people sort of, you know, really interject and change it. And uh, I wish that we could do this in real life. <laughs> <laughs> Ali, um, how ch challenging was this as a topic for you uh, compared to others that you've covered in forum theatre? Pretty challenging, actually. Um, so a lot of the forum theatre shows that I've written previously have been um, a little bit more straightforward. Like you <laughs> might have a situation where young people are bullying other young people or someone's having a mental health crisis and what do we do? Or there's a workplace conflict. Whereas yet yeah, the chains, the links and the number of links and the change and, 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 and the possible different scenarios, uh, not to mention the fact that we had to come up with some kind of scientific thing. <laughs> <laughs> that, <Last noise. laughs> you know, that wasn't COVID, it wasn't anything specific, but it could be metaphorically applied to the world. Um, yeah, and we, we actually, truth be told, we only really got there at Wednesday night. We, we, we were just, and I think we just gave ourselves the grace to keep trying and changing <laughs> our ideas until we sort of felt that we got something that could, could offer that potential. Mm. Yeah, but, yeah, lots of, lots of chain, chain links, chain reactions. Well, it's sort of how science works as well, right? It's a try, try again, you fail, yeah. and you keep trying and pushing, and then you get, you get some magic. That's and then right. You get, get yeah. progress, yeah. Uh, not just magic. <laughs> <laughs> you get results, mm. and that lets you um, move forward. That's fantastic. Robin, for you as well, what was, a, what was it like delving into science as a sub as subject matter, and, and also the communication of science and the importance of that, and how it's helped set up the catastrophe that was presented to us tonight? Um, it's an area I'm really interested in. We've, I, I've done a, a number of smaller projects which in some way deal with some similar issues. We did a project um, a few years ago uh, called Moving Climates, which was based on interviews with climate scientists and then them interpreted by a multidisciplinary team. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, it is science communication has become one of the critical issues for the survival of our species, really. I mean, that, um, that we are at a point in how science around, you know, particularly around issues like climate and other environmental issues is communicated is, may well determine, you know, whether, whether our species is still around in 200 years. Yeah, yeah, really, really fascinating. And, and can I say myself as a science communicator, working with scientists and the science that they, the knowledge that they have, it's so essential 
to be understood and to be uh, listened to, but the responsibility of that and the way that that was portrayed I thought was really compelling tonight. Phil, as a science communicator, I mean, how did dealing with the subject matter, I guess, give you, did it give you a different perspective on science communication? Well, yeah, my background's physics and there's not so many nastoids in physics. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it's made, me, it's made me a little worried now about what kind of things... Because, to me, what the, what the professor was doing there, he knew what he knew about and he was interested in the mechanism and that was interesting. And the repercussions of how far out that could go um, are just, they're so far, there's so many ways that it could reach out into the community and touch people in good and bad ways. And it's so hard to predict that, you know. Mm. I mean, it, it, in retrospect, it's quite obvious what we, you know, should have done. But at the beginning, it's like, how could I have known that would go there? Joe, for you as well, um, I mean, are the sorts of issues that were raised tonight uh, similar ones that you face and did, it, did they resonate? I mean, I think it, for me it was all about the responsibility, really. Um, so, I mean, I am a chemist, I am an analytical chemist, I can totally say that, it's fine. Um, <clears throat> and, um, yeah, so I guess kind of seeing the repercussions of what Fiona had uh, had done. I know from my kind of perspective, it's like, well, there's a, a nature chemistry paper. That's amazing. Let's get that out. That's exciting. Let's just put that out there. And then it all just kind of spiralled out of control. Um, I think that was really scary. Um, but yeah, it was, it was really interesting. And it was like coming up with everything and, and workshopping the story, you know, we were kind of like, oh, but that could happen. Oh, but what about that? Oh, that could happen. But I think there should be a step there, but wait, no, that could happen. And it was just, yeah, that kind of spiral was crazy. Yeah, fantastic. Mm. I just really want to encourage uh, everyone in the Shine Dome here tonight, if you have a question, I'll be, I'd love to hear you uh, ask it, so I'll come uh, over to you in a couple of moments. And also, if you're watching uh, online, uh, post a question in the YouTube comments, uh, I'll be happy to read that out as well. A uh, couple of final ones to the rest of our cast. So, uh, Linda, have you acted in anything like this before? Because really, that's your background. That, that is my background. What were the, what were the challenges? Um, so I've had some experience with forum theatre before, but primarily with kind of quite young audiences. So it was nice to see some of those faces tonight. Um, this was different because I guess coming into kind of the scientific field, there's such a fear from someone who doesn't really come from that background of, of getting it wrong and not being able to understand the specifics of the jargon or potentially needing to talk about, I don't know, being forced to jump into a scientist role and making up a whole lot of compound names. So um, it's really interesting to kind of navigate that space, I think. Um, but generally, I mean, these two in particular made it so easy, mm, even yeah. not coming from a pure drama background. And I think that kind of trust and support in the process just made the whole thing come together like that. We had, what, about a week to pull this together? Yeah. yeah. Really, really happy. Really impressive. Yeah, no, great result. Joel, um, finally for you, uh, before we go to our, our audience for more questions, um, what was the, the process like of developing this, uh, this performance, particularly you had a week to pull it together? Yeah. A, a lot of discussion. I mean, because we have two specifically uh, two science communicators, it was easier because they, they have some idea of how to get this across to you know, a pleb like me, uh, and I don't really know from science. So a, a lot of discussion, a lot of uh, team building. Uh, yeah, as Linda was saying, take, putting characters in, putting scenes in and just culling stuff. And, yeah, what works? What, what do we need to consider if we go this way? Yeah, yeah fantastic. Well, Anna Maria, I know you, uh, you had your hand up. What would you like to ask? I wanted to ask Ali a question around preparation. Did you feel you needed to, um, uh, I want to say research, but um, really look into how science works broadly before you could stitch this together? And did you feel some burden of responsibility around potentially um, exacerbating stereotypes that aren't necessarily good for science, uh, like the pressures of ARC. Um, <laughs> uh, and th they're stereotypes, but they're real. But um, potentially overinflating some of those aspects in a way that could be um, uh, could send people's views in the wrong direction. 
it was, that, it was a big, um, yes. The answer is yes, I did. Mm -hmm. We did. Uh, we didn't have a very long lead up time for this project, but the way that we work in forum theatre is that our participants, so that is Phil and Joe and also the science communicators that we met in an engaged um, online activity, they're the ones that guide the project and guide the direction. Having said that, it is almost almost guaranteed that when we start to get up and create and move and activate a scene, the stereotypes are the first ones we see. And we live probably for the first whole day of rehearsals in uh, um, hilarious stereotypes. <laughs> and then, and then uh, you know, like um, we had an influencer for a few days there. She got, <laughs> she got killed off, but yeah. she was great. Um, and um, and we also had the you know the CEO uh, of the of the town factory. He was a, he was a baddie at first, and that was so easy. It was so easy to be the person that makes the money, but we needed to make sure that we created a more realistic character. And so we actually spent quite a bit of time making sure that we understood that Bruce really genuinely cared. And, and you could feel it. The audience wanted him to be the baddie. And so it's a really important part of our process in that, in that we understand that this is human life and we're not, we don't wear, I'm a goodie badge and I'm a baddie badge and all the baddies are wrong and all the goodies are right. That's just not how we work. And that's why life is complicated. So, yeah. so yeah, we definitely, if we don't know, we ask our science communicators yeah. And we did a lot of that. <laughs> and, and then we definitely make sure that our characters um, are complex. And so even though you might only see the story run for 20 minutes, there's quite a lot of backstory about what's motivating them, you know, what's bringing the story to life. And then that helps, of course, um, in the interventions. Yeah, wonderful. Uh, we've only got a few more minutes for questions. So uh, I see one over here. There's uh, one at the front as well. Oh, I, oh Cara. Cara, you're still with us. Thank you. <laughs> Please, <laughs> fire away. Hi, uh, Stephanie has a question. Oh. You're muted, we're, Stephanie. Yeah, we're not hearing you at the moment, but we'll just see if uh, that audio... Okay, sorry. We've got it now. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I just wanted to ask, because um, with the play, I noticed uh, the interest of what is success to the scientist, to the communicator, the public is different. So in this context, do we understand that science communication, there is different objectives or purpose or what is terms as success to other people? Because you see, for the scientist, it's a, a paper on nature. For the communicator is to have a, an article or something up. Mm. For the public is to really get and understanding is what what I'm experiencing related to this. So has research been done on that? So I think it's more like marketing. Just know your audience, what is supposed to be relayed on that uh, uh, um, in that particular case. I don't know. I'm seeing science communication as marketing. Bad, but it's true. <laughs> Would anyone else like to comment on that? Yeah, I think it'd be interesting if there was a new research into like what are the motivators of all the chains of science communication and maybe someone's already done that i mean i'm not sure all right i do have a couple coming through uh online as well but uh any others in the room just while we're here there is one up the back just bear with me i'll just answer that ali yes there's a there's a literature of science communication there's a there's a study there's a study of science communication and and they look at a lot about audiences and what their attitudes are and how you might reach them or how you there might be challenges in reaching them um mm. yeah so there's a lot of um, research in the research of exactly research. <laughs> yeah mm. fantastic bill is there enough research yet <laughs> uh what's interesting in a way is that we might need science communication communicators <laughs> because there's there's a body of science communication research that doesn't always get translated to scientists so that they know what works and what doesn't. They keep doing the same old thing. 
All right. Yeah. Yes, there are many, many links, many links to be made in the chain. That's for sure. So we had another question uh, back here. Yeah, I'm sort of for our futures. Uh, are there any resources or uh, tips? Sorry, about could you speak up a little bit, please? I think it's yeah, yeah. yeah um, wondering if there are any resources or um, the panelists have any tips about how we, how anyone can analyse and decipher some of the science communication so that we can tell what is good and what is not so good in terms of what what we are being presented to us because you've demonstrated to us tonight that there are different ways and different standards and different motivations. How do we tell? Yeah. Hans? Yeah. Uh, oh. Hans, okay. Hans, okay. Mm -hmm. what one comment for me would be slow down. So I think one great lesson I got from the play is that people had sort of stepped out their role if they had the opportunity and slowed down a bit and thought about their consequences, that would help. And regarding your question, I think it's, it's about finding trusted sources. Uh, you know, th there's so much information out there. We're not short of information, mm -hmm. but the key point is what would you trust, where would you look? And that's, yeah. I think, the challenge for science and for the audience to do that. All right, wonderful. Look, uh, we do have to um, wrap up shortly, but I have a couple of questions that have come in uh, in the YouTube comments. Uh, and these are about how this came about at all this evening, this collaboration, uh, which is a great way uh, to summarise uh, how we got here. But first, I'll just ask the question, I think, of the cast um, of... How did you come to work together? Does anyone want to um, want to answer that and, and just help tell a bit of the story? And then I'll throw to Hans for the full context. Sure. Um, I saw a post on Facebook. <laughs> 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 um, so I work with um, kids at a science museum in Wollongong, um, which is amazing. And if you're ever down there, you should totally go. There we go. Tick. Um, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so I, as part of my job, I um, train my staff how to perform. And so... I am always on the lookout for kind of opportunities like this. And um, yeah, it was just kind of like a perfect sort of meeting of all of the different things that I do, which is great. So as Anna Maria mentioned at the beginning of the evening, tonight's uh, uh, performance was a collaboration between the Academy of Science, mm -hmm. the Falling Walls Foundation and Rebus Theatre. Hans, tell us a bit more about uh, what led to this point and the history that the Academy has, uh, at least with Falling Walls and now Rebus. Well, let me start with a great thanks to Fording Walls. I mean, that's a, an activity in Berlin <laughs> that is global. And uh, I think for every theatre company, a big question is, how do I find an audience? <laughs> <laughs> and that's what Fording Walls uh, gives us. It started off as a competition for bright ideas that would change the world. And that's been going for about 10 years. And then more recently, I think it's a very important new dimension is how to communicate, and it's so culturally dependent. Every country has a different way of communicating. So having a global forum really makes it work, and that's why the Academy is so keen to work with Falling Walls, because it gives us this uh, big reach. And a big thank you to you, Paul, and the whole team. We can't see, because... I think two years ago we wouldn't have thought this is possible. Right? COVID's told us something that we can communicate. You gave us the technology. You respond quickly. It takes many people, like the credits at the end of a movie. And uh, now we can talk across the world and get feedback. And now actually having the audience influencing the play. That's fantastic. <laughs> Very beautifully said, Hans. Thank you so much. And yeah, thanks especially uh, to my team, Tom Carruthers, uh, at the back uh, in the bio box. You can't see him, but he's been um, pushing the buttons and making the magic uh, work. Uh, we have Michael from Elite uh, Technologies and the team who have been assisting uh, with the audio visual. Uh, we have Natalie Hines, who's been helping from our events team this evening, uh, as well as uh, Sydney Livingston Peters, who really was the project manager for this entire <laughs> event. I have to say, it would not have been possible without Sydney putting in many, many uh, hours of work to pull together tonight. So thank you very much. 
so congratulations to you all for tonight's performance. thank you to everyone who has tuned in online. ah please continue to share this conversation with your friends and family and other colleagues because we need to keep this conversation going, a really important issue that's been tackled tonight. so thank you for coming along tonight, being part of this special event and good night.